50? 50 minutes, so we're talking NFPA 70B. Who can tell me what NFPA 70B, what is it? What? Maintenance, absolutely. Electrical system, electrical maintenance. Um, don't let me forget. I know he's the man, but I gotta give you these tickets at the end. Um, and we are doing PDH certificates for those of you who are in the room, not out there online. Um, so we're doing some PDH certificates. I'll display a screen at the end that'll help you get that. And you probably, if, you're, if you were in a previous session, probably have that under check. My name is Thomas Dimitrovich. I'm Director of Codes and Standards for Eaton. And I am also on NFPA 70B for maintenance. I do not speak in behalf of any, of any panel members, nor NFPA, nor NEMA, nor Eaton. What comes out of here, start it up here, and it's all from the heart, right? So question everything you hear and everything you see. And if you have any questions, please uh, just shout them out. This is a, where we go is completely up to everybody in this room, all right? So we're gonna talk 70B, electrical systems, uh, the maintenance. Required, so registered continuation, uh, continu continue educational program with RCEP, and you probably saw this in the last one as well. Educational activities protected, provide all this good stuff, so obligatory. All right, so when we think about maintenance and why it's important, we do, a, we do maintenance for a lot of different reasons. The first one, obviously, is going to be around safety. What we're going to discuss in our, dis yeah, what we're going to discuss in this session today is the relationship of 70B with a few other key documents. 70E for electrical safe work practices and the National Electrical Code, NFPA 70. And you're going to hear, uh, uh, I'm going to bring in NFPA 99 and a few, maybe a few other documents as well because maintenance is a critical, important part of your safety plan or whatever facility you are in. So safety is number one, cost obviously, if I can, you know, if I can reduce downtime, if I can reduce downtime, that's money. That's money, and, and I don't have to put lives at risk. If I have a process that can't make products anymore, if I have uh, a process that can't process people, and I get paid to do that, then I, I'm going to lose money. So if I can perform maintenance, I can increase my uptime, and that will translate into financials. And <laughs> although a lot of the salespeople in the audience here probably would love to say, hey, I'll sell you new equipment, we don't want to sell equipment because other equipment that has to be replaced because it wasn't maintained. That's just not good for anybody, right? So you wanna maintain the life of your products, and it's just like your vehicle at home. It's an investment. Your electrical distribution system inside of your plants and your facilities, your residential dwelling unit, it doesn't matter. It's an investment for the facility, for your business, and you have to maintain it. You have a vehicle, we all have, well, not everybody may, may, may not have vehicles. I was just in an area where nobody had vehicles. They all just got on the bus. But uh, if you have vehicles, you have any infrastructure, anything, it's just as personal, uh, you take care of it and it'll last longer. We tell our kids that, right? I know my dad used to tell me, take care of your toys. So in any case, we can extend our equipment life, we can uh, lower the cost of ownership. But again, you have to have the mindset. You have to understand, and it's hard to sell up. It's very difficult to sell up the fact that you've got to pour maintenance into your facility, right? and it's about budgets. If you don't have a budget for it, I remember when I first started with Eaton back in 1996, I had a phone call, and it was a gentleman who wanted to defeat the ground fault protection on a motor protection relay, it was IQ 1002. And he says, how do I defeat this? And I, and I said, well, you know, I talked to my other guys, I'm relatively new to the company, I said, oh, just, they said, well, just turn the ground fault protection up. He said, I already did that. I said, um, so you turned the ground fault protection up to a maximum setting? He goes, yes, I did. And then I put them on hold, and I went back to 
the other guys, I'm like, okay, we, he, he already increased it. They were like, well, he's got a ground fault. So I got back on the phone. I told him, sir, I said, uh, you know, he goes, boy, you tell me I have a ground fault. <laughs> he goes, I already know I have a ground fault. I said, oh, you do? He says, yes. He says, you don't understand. He says, I live in a salt, I work in a salt mine. He goes, in salt, we need to explain what happens. Salt builds up on the terminations, and then I get a ground fault. He says, but I don't have a budget for maintenance. I do have a budget to replace the motor and the conductors. So I want the thing to fail so that I can order a new motor and new conductors. That is the behavior that you get when you don't fund maintenance, right? So maintenance is a critical part for just plant operations. There are no lives at risk. They, he, he said, no one's going to get hurt. He says, I just want to disable this ground fault protection, let it fail, it'll be in a controlled environment, and then I'll replace it. So we don't want that type of behavior. So we want to get individuals performing maintenance. Compliance, 70E, 99, 70B just went from a recommended practice to a standard, and that's a big deal. That's a big deal. Uh, there are people like the Department of Energy, there are plants, uh, facilities, government facilities that are mandated to follow 70B. And they were following 70B when it was a recommended practice, and it puts them in a tough position because the language in a recommended practice is like, a, you know, you could do this, you should do this, and you might want to consider well, how do you enforce that, right? So when it moved to a standard, that means the language goes from a you could, you should, to a you shall. And then we had to do a lot of thinking on what are the actual requirements? Because you can't just take all the you coulds and you shoulds. You really have to think about what is the minimum requirement. So we had to do a lot of work in, uh, in ferreting through the existing language in 70B and, and come up with what is actually enforceable. So there are, uh, in the National Electrical Code, I didn't put that in there too, the National Electrical Code has some requirements for maintenance as well. And we don't need to have the debate here, but I know some uh, have the, um, they have an issue with a maintenance requirement in the installation requirements in the National Electrical Code because they say it just doesn't belong there. It's hard to, the National Electrical Code is an installation requirement. When do we enforce it is on installation. It's not like I go back every five years and review the National Electrical Code again, right? Unless I'm doing a change in my facility, adding something new, pulling permits, depending upon your AHJ, which in many industrial facilities, the AHJ is like the plant manager, so to speak. So in any case, um, there are other standards that NFPA and others publish that will say you need to perform maintenance, and 70B is the recommended uh, industry reference for that. And in some cases, insurance companies will require you to have um, insurance and have a maintenance plan in place. So, because if they're going to insure you, they want to make sure that, uh, that you're not doing things that are going to jeopardize their Remember, insurance is all risk-based. And we're gonna talk risk-based. In fact, if you come to my ARC flash and, uh, and the NEC, we'll talk risk there as well. But it's all about risk. What is risk comprised of? Two components. I'll give you the first one, likelihood. What's the second? <laughs> likelihood and severity, you're good. Likelihood and severity. Those are your two aspects of risk. And when you think about maintenance, the lack of maintenance, the likelihood of an event goes up, and quite possibly, depending upon the energy, the severity could go up as well. So arc flash, wow, I didn't even think about that, but uh, arc flash, likelihood and severity. If, I have, if I'm not performing maintenance, I can uh, increase the likelihood of an arc flash event, and the severity of that arc flash event is gonna be dependent upon the clearing time of the upstream overcurrent protective device. And if I didn't maintain that upstream overcurrent protective device, what happens to the clearing time? It's gonna go longer. And what is incident energy? What are the two components, two key components for incident energy? Current and time. Man, I love all of you. That's awesome. Current and time. Man, I'm like preaching to the choir here. So uh, catastrophic failures, fire hazards, all that, uh, 
bad stuff, I was going to say all that good stuff, all that bad stuff can happen with a lack of maintenance. All right, unplanned outages. This, there, you know, if you look at statistics, it, there are statistics in any industry, uh, whether you are in uh, petrochem, automotive, uh, even healthcare, uh, doesn't matter what industry you're in, there's, there are statistics about unplanned outages and downtime and the cost of that to your process. In the petrochem industry, every minute counts. Automotive industry, every minute counts. So um, if you don't do maintenance, your unplanned outages will go through the roof. And I don't know if any, I know I've worked for industrials before I came to Eaton, I worked for a architectural engineering firm that did some work with utilities and commercial and engineering or uh, commercial and industrial establishments. And when they had unplanned outages, it was a mess, it was a nightmare, right? They spend a lot of money because you wanna get as many people on that project to get things done quickly and get the processes back up and running again. So in some cases, you might be able to look in your own facilities and talk to the right people in your organizations and say, how many unplanned outages have we had in the past? And do some root cause analysis. You may find that um, maintenance is, uh, is at the heart of that. And remember, maintenance is not just working on a piece of equipment. Maintenance could be doing your studies, doing your short circuit coordination, arc flash, your reliability studies, all of those, the studies also play a very critical part in the role of electrical safety and reliability. One line diagrams, man, there's a soapbox I would love to get off of because I am always harping on people about one line diagrams. You can't have an arc flash analysis or a short circuit study without a one line diagram that is accurate and up to date. You can't expect our electrical workers to establish an electrically safe work condition for 70E doing lockout tag out procedures if they don't know where the sources of energy come from. The one line diagram is like at the heart. And if you go to most of the facilities around our country and, and, and abroad and ask them for their latest uh, the one line diagram, they'll find, you'll find something that is completely out of date. It's the last thing done on a project and all the money's run out. So you can focus on just that. There, in 70B, we, we talk about maintenance of your power systems analysis studies as well. They're very critically important. All right. It became a standard for electrical safety in the workplace. We are required to do a, now, let me just give you a relationship. How many of you are familiar with 70E for safe work practices? All right. So. You understand the way 70E operates. 70E is a work practice. This is, I'm going to perform work and this is my methodology of how I'm gonna get it done safely. 70E is used, I like, it, I like to think about it as if you're going to develop your safety plan, you're the chef in your kitchen and you're gonna make a souffle and you need the ingredients for your souffle, 70E includes your ingredients. You don't do everything that's in 70E. 70E might have medium voltage equipment, right? And you may not have any medium voltage equipment. If you're a residential dwelling unit and that's your work, you have no medium voltage equipment in that facility, in that house, right? So you will pick and choose from 70E what fits your business and your application to develop your safety plan. So 70E requires for you to do that thought process and it gives you the tools to do that. 70B is the same way. 70B has a lot of maintenance, a lot of guidance or, or requirements, used to be guidance, requirements on what you need to do for safety, but there's, um, there's chapters in there for medium voltage equipment, there's chapters in there for motors, or for a lot of different things that you may not have in your facility. But suffice it to say, your requirement is you need to have a maintenance plan, yes. 70B, okay, so the trilogy. The NEC includes the installation requirements. Those are what I'm going to install, how I need to install it. 70B is just maintenance, right? And now 70, the National Electrical Code, is enforced by authorities having jurisdiction. 
the AHJ, whether it be a city inspector, a local inspector, or it could be in your plants, it could be your, uh, whoever's in charge of that project it would be the AHJ, quote unquote AHJ. 70B and 70E don't have that same level of enforcement. There's nobody going to walk in your facility and say, all right, um, let me see your maintenance plan. This, this is a motor control center. I need to see your maintenance plan. I need to see your one-line diagram. Somebody's going to do that. Do you know who might do that? Who might do that in your facility? OSHA. OSHA might do that. And you know what? You don't want OSHA coming in and doing that, right? <laughs> right? Because OSHA is going to be there because it's going to be after an event. So 70E, safe work practices, and 70B are on our shoulders. We're responsible. We have to make sure that we are following those two documents and those policies and procedures to avoid an event in our facility where we can't explain our processes that we use to avoid it. Yes. So I've been looking for an article because Trying to say, hey, where is this? Well, it's needed, but I had it. Right. So what you would have to do is go to uh, OSHA 1910 and 1920. So in 1910 and 1920, they'll they'll bring up uh, the. Uh, the, the laws around maintaining your power distribution system and your shock protection and your 70E and stuff. So you've got to go to the OSHA. Remember, OSHA cannot enforce 70E or 70B. Okay. They will not enforce it. They'll enforce their laws, okay? And then they'll use 70B and 70E to say, this is what you should have been doing. That's the T. Because, yes. Right, you gotta go to, you gotta go to the OSHA, OSHA regulations, and um, if I had more than an hour, 50 minutes, <laughs> we could go there. But, uh, but no, it, it, but that's where the, the hook is between the two, because OSHA used to enforce the National Electrical Code, right? And it wasn't until, until the, you know, when, you, when you're from a safe work practices, it's like, well, this is what the installation requirements are, and you put that individual on the stand, they're going to go, well, wait a second, that's not a safe work, that's an installation requirement. So OSHA went to NFPA and said, look, I need a document that helps me, helps OSHA say, and tell workers what do they need to do for safe work practices. Yeah. So the change is, so here's the thing, you have 70E, okay, 70E, and specifically in 70E, it'll say, you have to have maintained, and I'll have some language in here, your equipment needs to be maintained. What is the industry document that we use for maintenance to make sure that I'm following the rules in 70E because OSHA's gonna be saying, look, you didn't do this, you didn't do that, and 70E is your practice, and then 70E says you have to do maintenance, and then we went from 70E, which is a standard, to a document that was a recommended practice. So you had the trilogy of the installation requirements the safe work practices, and then you have this recommended practice on maintenance. So the shift had to occur. I'm surprised it didn't occur sooner than this cycle, but it had to occur where maintenance was a mandatory um, a requirement instead of a recommended practice. That's basically filling out that trilogy because if 70E says, hey, it has to be maintained, how are you showing that it's maintained, right? The electrical worker has to walk into it. If the electrical worker is gonna work on this piece of equipment, they have to look and ascertain the condition of maintenance. That's a 70E requirement. And if I can't demonstrate how to determine the condition of maintenance and whether it was maintained, then seven, your, your safety plan is on stand. It's not on a good foundation. 70B99 has uh, requirements for healthcare facilities to have an electrical maintenance program. These documents will point to and say, follow industry practice. So 70B is just sort of stepping up to the plate. These are your different types. You have a code, you have a standard, and you have a recommended practice. The NFPA 70, 70, 70, not 70, 70, is a code. Codes can be adopted by jurisdictions. So if you think about the National Electrical Code, whichever state you guys and gals are in, your state or your local jurisdiction may adopt the National Electrical Code. And I say may adopt the National Electrical Code because not all states and not all jurisdictions 
adopt the NEC and enforce the NEC. Okay, where I live, I live in Weirton, West Virginia, the inspector will look at my service. They will not walk in the house. They will not enforce the NEC inside the dwelling unit in my, in my town. Now, if I lived in Morgantown or, or, Morgantown or uh, another, other larger city, cities within uh, West Virginia, they'll, they'll inspect the entire structure, right? So you've got to think about from an enforcement perspective, A, you've got to think about who is the HJ is going to be enforcing the National Electrical Code, right? But, but 70B and 70E are not codes. They're standards. 99 just moved recently, I think a couple cycles ago, to a, to a code. Now it's the healthcare code. Now it can be adopted and enforced. A standard is, the language of a standard basically is gonna to go to a you shall. And then you have the recommended practices, which are the, uh, you know, you could, you shoulds. Yeah. Oh, good question. Good question. So when we're developing the requirements in 70B, I can't legally copy language from one document and put into another. So we as a committee have to create the requirements and we based it on what was in 70B. So what we did was we took, the philosophy was, all right, let's take everything that's in 70B, which is all the you coulds, you shoulds, that's all annex material, which is not enforceable. And then out of that, what are we gonna make the requirements? Sitting on our 70B committee are those represent, our representatives from NIDA, and they're providing that input uh, that aligns very well. So I, I can tell you over and over again, we would hear of the NIDA person uh, who, does the, who does this type of work, maintenance, they'll say, well, it, at, in our NIDA standards, this is how we operate. So a lot of that, from the, so they had direct influence through presence on the code panel. Yes. Absolutely, yep. And now what's nice about this is now it's an ANSI process that everybody partakes in, they're in, uh, manufacturers are in, and other industry players are in as well, so. Yep, so those are basically your three. And 70B moved from recommended practice to a standard. All right, National Electrical Code. All right, the NEC has installation requirements. We already talked about this, adopted as law. And who's my time tracker? You're my time tracker? 1022, all right, all right. Just remember if, uh, about quarter till, I'm, rel I'm relying on you to say, hey, you got five minutes. All right, it's your job. You'll get, uh, you'll get a ticket. You'll get a ticket. I'll give you a ticket, all right? <laughs> Just like everybody else. All right, so uh, we already said, we already talked about the National Electrical Code. We talked about 70E, safe work practices, uh, acts as a basis of standards for many enforceable practices by OSHA, right? OSHA is not gonna enforce 70E, but they will enforce their laws and they'll use 70E as, the, as their backup and their arguments, their w yeah, yep. And 70B is your preventative maintenance. Uh, one of the things, so one of the things that we did do as a committee, manufacturers will have maintenance recommendations. I don't care what you buy, right? It just seems like, and you know what happens to all of those? <laughs> you know, we call that dumpster diving, right? So it's like, oh man, we gotta perform maintenance. What did the manufacturer say? I don't know, is that dumpster still around? When do we install it? <laughs> okay, it's probably gone. But then you can go up online, right? But in any case, um, your, um, what we recognized in 70B was the fact that manufacturers have recommended maintenance schedules and procedures. And 70B is not designed or meant to supersede those. So we put specific language up front in the document to say, look, follow manufacturer's instructions. Follow the manufacturer's policies and procedures. If there are areas where they differ, where maybe the manufacturer might say, look, if you, are, if, you're, if you have this device, you don't have to perform maintenance for every five years. And 70B says every two years. You're still gonna follow the manufacturer's uh, instructions. If the manufacturer doesn't cover certain things, then you're gonna fall back on 70B, right? So you're gonna be looking at 70B. Remember, it is, 70B is a resource for you. If you talk to somebody who has a safety plan, you say, what's your safety plan? And they go, oh, I follow 70E. They're not following a safety plan. The safety plan has to be your safety plan. 70E is your recipe, has your ingredients. 
you need to figure out what of those ingredients apply to your facility. Same thing with 70B. It includes the ingredients for your recipe, for your souffle, right? All right, so national consensus standard. Uh, we just went to a, and it's 2023, and I argued with NFPA, but, and we all did as a group. It's the same cycle as the National Electrical Code. And I sit on panels two and 10 for the NEC, plus this all in the same cycle, that is a nightmare. Um, often a requirement for insurance companies. We already talked about all that. We said uh, safety related maintenance requirements, and this is your maintenance condition of maintenance. If you look at 70E again, it'll tell you, you what do we use 70 for? We, we dress with PPE. We're relying on equipment to do their job. To do its job. And if the equipment is not maintained, it's not going to do its job or may not do its job. You don't know. You can't ascertain whether or not it will or not because you haven't maintained it. So your 70E safe work practices plan is null and void because you're basing it on a, a system that's not maintained. Very important to maintain the system. I call that the trilogy, right? 70, 70E, 70B, they all work together. If I didn't install it correctly, 70E will tell you, if you didn't install it correctly, you have equipment that's over duty from a fault current perspective. The interrupting ratings on your circuit breakers are exceeded. You can't rely on it to open, the, open safely. You get what we call an unintended rapid disassembly in the field. Okay, right? You don't want an unintended rapid disassembly in the field. So, and, and then I have people who ask me, well, Tom, what happens to the breaker or the equipment if I don't maintain it? I don't know. <laughs> That's not my job. <laughs> I don't. I tell you how you're supposed to operate it and how you're supposed to do that. I can't tell you what's going to happen. I can tell you it's probably not going to be something that's pleasurable, right? So, um, what we do in 70, 70E tells you that your normal operating condition, why is that important? There are some individuals at one point in our safe work practices history, in anything, you'll have this side of the room and you'll have that side of the room, okay? You'll have this side of the room that'll say, you can, if there's a piece of, uh, there's a panel board in here on the wall, you can't walk in that door without wearing personal protective equipment because an energy source. Then you'll have another side of the room that says, I not only can walk into this room without having PPE on, I can take the cover off of that as long as I'm not in there trying to do something. Okay? So you have both perspectives. <laughs> so 70E said, look, if it is properly installed, National Electrical Code, if the equipment is properly maintained, NFPA 70B, the equipment is used in accordance with instructions, manufacturer's instructions, the equipment doors are closed and secured, all equipment covers are in place, there is no evidence of impending failure. You don't have a hazardous environment, okay? So, but 70B is part of that, and the National Electrical Code is a part of that. In, in making sure that you have a normal operation condition. Now, turning a breaker on and off, there are some individuals that'll say, you can't turn a circuit breaker on and off unless you have personal protective equipment, full, full dress. And you're like, well, if it's a normal operating condition, I'm following manufacturer's instructions, it's properly maintained, properly installed, I can turn a circuit breaker on and off, I can turn a switch on and off. But if I walk up to that switch, it's all rusty, and I can tell it's got holes in the side because it wasn't, they didn't fill those holes. Now I'm gonna look at this and go, I'm not throwing that arm. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can feel the heat, you know? So, but in any case, so, and I talked to an arc flash survivor. And uh, one, his event was, he walked up to a disconnect switch. It was at a meat processing location. He was by himself. He said, he looked at the switch. It was all rusty. There were a few holes in it. He had to turn it off. And he went back to his truck, put his PPE on, he came back and he turned it off. And when he turned it off, he said he heard a twang. And the next thing he knew, he was on the ground waking up because the people in the meat processing facility saw him hit the ground and they got him, broke two or three of his ribs. The door came off, he, he couldn't see very good. He, he's got light sensitivity and his ears. He had ear damage, hearing damage. So maintenance is a critical part from a safe work practices and, and 70E tells you what the normal operating conditions are and it leverages what I call the uh, trilogy. Okay, there, you know, 
dirt build up inside of a panel board. Now, you probably had to take the door off to see this, <laughs> right? Um, when you look at equipment, in some, I was in one facility, I was in a facility in St. Louis, and they wanted, they wanted a review, a 70E safety review of their facility. Beautiful. I went with the salesperson who was gonna try to figure out, how do we quote this, right? We went into to room after room after room, and it was a, um, it was, they manufactured something, because we had to wear, <laughs> I had to wear like a little heady hoodie, but I had to wear the booties and all this stuff, so it was a food place, right? And every room we went into, every door was open on all of their control panels, all of their panel boards, so you could see all the breakers. And I asked the question, why? And they said, well, we wanna, we wanna be able to inspect it. We wanna be able to walk into a room and see all of our equipment. Wow, man, that's like ungood. We call that ungood, <laughs> all right? But that was their perspective. So, so we had a lot of educating to do in that regard. So we have covers and we, and we keep things covered up on purpose. When you see a lot of rust and degradation of the uh, installation, you look at all these terminals, it, uh, it just, Probably a chemical room. Hazardous locations and chemical processing, right? What's your biggest philosophy? What should be your philosophy? And I know we sell a lot of hazardous location equipment. Don't put it in a hazardous location, okay? Keep it outside of the hazardous location and keep it in a, a, a the conditioned space and you're golden, right? Not golden, but you're better off. <laughs> you're what? That's so it's, yeah, yep. All right, 70E and 70B relationship. I talked a little bit about this. The, remember, uh, now, arc flash and shock. More people die from shock every year than arc flash. You have exposed conductors. You have equipment that is, uh, you close the door and you hear something drop inside. You could energize the enclosure, right? You can energize and create a hazardous location such that the moment somebody touches it, they're electrocuted. We had that on, uh, I said on panel two, for the National Electrical Code, and I, unfortunately, we mandate and we, we review all the public inputs for 210.8 GFCIs. And there was a case, uh, I think it was two cycles ago, of a child who jumped over a fence, put his hand on an HVAC unit, and was killed. Coming home because he didn't want to hit, uh, didn't want to exceed curfew, right? There was a fault, a failure in the HVAC unit, and it energized the, the case, and it was just waiting for somebody to touch it at the right time. So you can have a condition that creates a shock hazard, and you don't know it because the fault's inside the equipment. It looks great from the outside. Maintenance, so, and then what we focus here on is the incident energy. If you are not maintaining your circuit breakers, and what do we rely on? Circuit breakers and fuses, we rely on them for the time portion, the clearing time, to establish, to reduce severity, right? So the NEC and other requirements help try to address likelihood and severity. The overcurrent devices, the clearing time is critically important to reduce the clearing time to reduce the severity, which is your arc flash hazard. So in scenario one and two, I have a six cycle clearing time. I got 5.8 calories per centimeter squared. I still would not want to face 5.8 calories per centimeter squared, but it's dressable, right? It's dressable. Uh, just wearing PPE, is that a guarantee you're not gonna get killed, hurt? Absolutely not, right? It's like fall protection. If I, actually, if I had to use fall protection, I wouldn't want to use fall protection, right? It's not a guarantee you're not gonna get killed or hurt severely. In a lot of these cases, you've got shrapnel and everything else that's coming out. So 5.8 calories, if, you, if your upstream circuit breaker does not clear, you could have a 29 calorie event and you're dressed for something a lot less, right? So, and there are pr procedures and processes to handle when you don't have, when you have a situation where you don't have maintenance um, on equipment which is, again, probably another eight-hour day, right? But in any case, um, you're not gonna know this. Your electrical worker is not gonna know unless they go to that piece of equipment and they look for the information that says it was properly maintained, or they look at your records. And if you don't have good records, the smart, the smart electrical contractor 
or electrician is going to step back and have a discussion about other methods and procedures that you'll have to take that might increase your downtime because they'll have to establish electrically safe work condition, et cetera, which they should anyway. Uh, 205.4 and 70E, overcurrent protected devices, there's the language. Industry consensus standards, maintenance tests, and inspections shall be documented. Right, that's your maintenance plan. You have to have it documented. You have to know how often did you do your maintenance? When was the last time you did perform maintenance? There are a lot of tools for you though. If, you're, if your maintenance says you have to cycle a circuit breaker annually, and you have a communication system to that piece of a, that, that circuit breaker, and you're logging when it's opened and closed, you probably will be able to say, look, that thing was opened last week, and I don't have to do that. So you can strategically plan your maintenance in your facility the more data and information that you have. So if you know circuit breakers, if you know a circuit breaker has been opened or closed, or if your circuit breaker has a health indication, that will give you some additional information so that you can focus your areas in the areas of a facility that need the love, as opposed to doing something just because it's a checklist, right? Take a smart approach to, say, to maintenance and you will improve your bottom line because you're gonna be doing the right things at the right times. We have, uh, and, and most manufacturers and most uh, NIDA or whomever's doing your testing and your maintenance will put labels on equipment or have reports that should be reviewed as part of your 70E preparation in your planning, the group, whatever piece of equipment you're gonna be working on, you're gonna look at the equipment, and then you're gonna say, what is my overcurrent protective device that's providing my instant energy reduction? It's probably not in that equipment. It's probably supplying it upstream, so you're gonna walk over to that equipment, you're gonna say, I need the maintenance records on this, and I need the maintenance records on that, and anything in between. All right, we've got 10 chapters. First 10 chapters, your general, basically general requirements. Administration, reference publications, definitions, your general requirements, personnel, safety. In chapter five, we pointed to 70E. We had a whole big thing in, seven, in chapter five, we just said, why are we regurgitating safety work practices when we can just point to 70E? There's your single line diagrams and system studies. You know who influenced that in the title? This guy, <laughs> okay? I tell you, that is the biggest issue that I come across on many facilities. You have your fundamental tests, field testing, and methods, et cetera. Then after chapter 10, now you get into a chapter for each of the pieces of equipment that are in your facility. If you don't have, if you don't have control power transformers, which <laughs> depends on your facility, if you don't have any, then you wouldn't follow chapter 38, right? So we have ground fault protection systems. So the way this works, you would go to the maintenance intervals, chapter nine and you would follow, you would say, okay, I have a circuit breaker or a fusible switch. You would go to that line and it'll tell you the frequency. It'll tell you how often should you do infrared or uh, uh, IR scanning or some method to determine the terminations. How often should you do a mechanical test, electrical test, mechanical, electrical, visual, and something else. Um, I have them in here. And then, and then you go to the chapter, say on fuses, chapter 16, and then if chapter 16 says, hey, if you have this type of fuse, you need to do this more frequently, it can modify and change what's in chapter nine, maintenance intervals, right? So you would look at the individual components and just to determine it'll have a section for each of those, visual inspections, mechanical, electrical, and there's like two more. <laughs> but in any case, each of those chapters, it tells you what to do for each of those products. Okay, and if you have a piece of equipment in your facility that's not on that list, do you know what that means? You can make a public input to 70B. Yeah. You would probably say, hey, I'm gonna call Tom D and, and say, I'd like to figure out a public input and I'll help you, all right? We have a crew of people that know how to do these things and we can help uh, with the maintenance and, you, and we rely on sometimes your experience and a little bit of our, our own experience if we make that solution. But we can help you construct that. And there's probably a lot of chapters missing. Chapter one, standard covers preventive maintenance electrical electronics, the purpose. Look, it says condition of maintenance of electrical equipment and systems for safety and reliability. And it tells you it's not intended to duplicate or subsede, supersede instructions provided by manufacturers, industrial plants, institutional, commercial buildings, and large multifamily residential complexes. Right, but if you have a dwelling unit, can you 
look at what you're supposed to do with receptacles? Sure, you know, but it's not designed specifically for that. Again, there's the trilogy. There's your reference by 70 and 70E. Conditional maintenance, this, uh, this is chapter three definitions. So we have chapter three, uh, so it follows a different style manual. Remember in the National Electrical Code, Article 100 is your definitions. In 70E, Article 100 is your definitions. Here it's chapter three. It follows a different NFPA style manual. Well, uh, we, didn't wanna, we didn't wanna try to confuse things even more by trying to put it into a different style manual. But in any case, your chapters, uh, chapter three gives you your t defined terms, condition of maintenance, and you have your qualified person. Uh, what I would say for, from a qualification perspective, you can't judge maintenance if you don't know the equipment, right? So you don't want me cooking your souffle. All right, highlights, uh, electrical maintenance program, chapter four. Uh, so this, is, this tells you you need to have an electrical maintenance program. This means, this tells you you have, to, you have to assess the condition of maintenance. One of the first steps, if you've never done maintenance in your facility, or if you have, I have I've, I've heard people say, oh, we have a maintenance plan. Go take a look at 70B, and then tell me if you have a, if you have a maintenance plan. Because once you look at 70B, you're gonna go, wow, I'm starting from scratch. And the first step, is to look at every piece of equipment in your facility and assess its condition of maintenance. Look at where it's at, look at its role in your process. If it's a critical part of the process, your importance goes up. If it's in public areas, the importance goes up, right? It's about what? Likelihood and severity. If I have a piece of equipment and it's in Timbuk4, it's in a locked room all the time, the severity is way low, but the likelihood might be way up. I might not perform maintenance on that piece of equipment, but I will on my, uh, if I have a piece of equipment in my entryway to my facility and it needs maintained. So, how much time? Whew, all right, electrical maintenance training. That's what we're doing. This is like an introduction, right? All right, cleaning person. No, so this is uh, equipment cleaning. You gotta make sure you're using the right equipment. You can't use, the, don't just, you know, Windex is not good for everything. All right, I love the stuff. You know, and, and, and um, what's that, uh, the stuff they use on ducks and stuff? Dawn, dish, I, I use Dawn at the house on everything, on my truck, on my everything. But uh, don't use it on electrical equipment, just saying, all right? Uh, electrical maintenance program, it tells you all the stuff you're supposed to have in your electrical maintenance program. Your chapter five gives you your qualified person, and this is your personnel safety, we go to 70E. Chapter six, your electrical system studies. These are all the studies you need to keep updated. And the single line diagram, whew, it's up there, up there. Like Anna Marie Albuquerque, Good Seasons Lady, it's in there. Bolted uh, bus connections, this is your, chapter seven is how you're looking at terminations. And you're looking at it, make sure you don't have a glowing connections and things like that, all of your termination. How do you determine thermography? How do you do maybe other ways other than thermography? There's your electrical, mechanical, chemical, and environmental. Uh, this is your risk assessment, special considerations. You're gonna have to do a risk assessment. Your testing category types, qualification. This is your chapter eight, this is your field testing and methods. This is when you, uh, like any, any equipment that you have in the field that you're doing testing with. You'll have a category one, one A, two and two A. Category one is energized, category two is offline. Category one A is not optional, Category 1A is enhanced. So you did a category one test, or you did a, yeah, you did a category one test. And the numbers are like, oh man, I wish they looked better. You may elect to do the 1A tests as a little bit further of investigation, okay? That's the way you use one and 1A, two and 2A. Online enhanced test, offline standard test, offline enhanced test. Remember, 2A is not optional. It is enhanced when you don't get the results you were looking for. You need to have your records, test records, all of your, just document. Document, 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 and when you're in doubt, document. Yes, do some more documentation. The more information, the more evidence trail you have, as long as you're doing the right things. If you're not doing the right things, then you know, sort of scramble up the papers a little bit. <laughs> you know, when the OSHA guy comes to town, oh yeah, yeah, we do that, yeah, yeah, it's over here. Well, it's, it's, it's at the house. Uh, my dog ate it. Continuous monitoring, predictive, we did recognize the fact that you might be doing continuous monitoring that might say, I need to maintain this guy 
more often than this guy because this guy's been doing what he's doing and he's never had any events, but you know, the temperature over here is getting hot and uh, I, he's tripped four or five times in the last six months and I got some issues over here. So you can adjust your maintenance schedules based upon data. And a lot of people will say, oh, I have to do it more frequently. It could be that you say, I don't have to do it more frequently. I might be able to put that off till next year. Because remember, you're going to have to implement your maintenance plan. You're going to have, to, you're going to have a facility. I've got uh, one, general, a large automotive manufacturer, the guy who's in charge of safety. He knows exactly how many GFCI receptacles are in his facility because you know why? He has a crew of people that's all they do. They come to work and they press buttons, test, reset, test, reset. They have a whole spreadsheet and they test all of their GFCIs and their plans. Every month. Absolutely. Yep. And he just yells at me. Define, <laughs> defining uh, frequency of maintenance. Again, there's your products, there's your scope, your conditions. I already talked about that table that's in chapter nine. You've got all your different equipment. There's your mechanical, visual, cleaning, lubrication, mechanical servicing, and electrical testing. So visual, cleaning, lubrication, mechanical servicing, electrical testing, and then any special considerations. Four minutes, all right. We're in a four minute countdown. All right, so physical condition, critical condition, and operating environment. So you've got to consider where your equipment is located. Do you think that maybe you have to perform maintenance on a circuit breaker that's in a marina right next to the water more often than the one that's in your basement in a nice air conditioned area? Probably, right? So the location of that, and do you think you might want to maintain an overcurrent device or a piece of equipment, structure, whatever it is, more frequently when it's on your main production line that if it goes down, you're losing hundreds of thousands of dollars a minute. You might want to make sure that's maintained, right? So you got to think about the physical condition, the criticality of that, and the operating environment of the, uh, this is all the condition assessment. This is your chapter 10, highlights electrical equipment designed for use in HasLock. All that good stuff, that's your hazardous locations, chapter 10, and then this gets into all of your different chapters. And this, so here's uh, low voltage power circuit breakers. You've got the, the tasks, whether it's a one or a two, do it energized or offline, online or offline, and if there's a 1A or a 2A, there's a 2A over here. Perform the instantaneous overcurrent trip test for electronic trip breakers by run up or pulse method, 2A. That's an enhanced test. If you didn't get results on something and uh, that you liked, you didn't quite like that much, then you're gonna wanna focus on doing some of these 2A tests or 1A tests. And in some cases, it'll be a one or a two, like check for cracks or lack of visual indication for all associated indicated status devices. You can do that either energized or, or not. My recommendation, establish an electrically safe work condition. But in some cases, you have to do things energized. Depends upon the test. So structure your work appropriately. Electrical equipment maintenance is directly related to the safety. All that jazz, so you get the gist. 70B is a great resource for you. You just have to learn how to use it appropriately and make sure you're building your own maintenance plan. You're not just following 70B. You're gonna build your maintenance plan for your facility or for your customer's facility and then you're going to focus on implementation. And implementation, depending upon the type of equipment you have, the type of monitoring, the data that you can get, if you, the more data you get, the better off, because now you can plan your maintenance instead of react or just have a checklist. You don't wanna go through life just saying, all right, today's Tuesday, I have to do this, 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 and this is Wednesday, even though, all of the work, you just cycled all of these breaker handles and they were probably all cycled within the last year for other normal operating reasons, right? So communication systems, uh, data on the circuit breaker themselves can help you manage the maintenance in your facility so that you can strategically apply resources as opposed to just blindly hiring as many people as you can and just say, here, here's your job. Now, when you have something like a GFCI that says press the test button monthly, there's only so much you can do there. One minute, wow. 
Look at that. Huh? <laughs> That's my last slide. Now, I'm going to do this for all of you out there. Get my standby because I'm going to do this. And I don't want them scanning this to get CEU credits. But you can scan that if you get your PDH, Professional Development Hours. You scan, I think you scan that. I mean, that's a QR code. Fill out the form, and if you've already filled out the form in a previous session, it's done for you. It's popping up, right? It's like Anna Brielle Baghetti, the Good Seasons Lady. It's in there, right? Anybody remember that commercial? No? Am I too old for that? Man, that was when I was little. Anna Marie Albaghetti, the Good Seasons Lady. Any questions on, on, um, on maintenance? Uh, no. I would say, it, I would expect insurance to have more of a play uh, or more invested, but I, most of this is driven by industry asking for, because they're required. I mean, you look at 70E and they're saying, well, 70E says I have to follow a maintenance plan and then they go to 70B and it's like, you know, you could do this, you should do that, and you know, it'd be a nice idea. And then they're like, you know, give me something more substantial, right? And um, so we were going to go from, uh, there was, there's an intermediate step. Well, there's a recommended practice, and then there was a media, intermediate step, and then a standard. We were going to do that process. But then a lot of people, like your DuPonts and others of the world, were like, no, we need this now. So we put the, we actually delayed the, uh, the, the process of, I think, by a couple years. I think it was about maybe one or two years to actually get it all taken care of, so. But yeah, yeah, but the insurance companies, uh, they, they're going to get an education and they're going to probably like what uh, 70B did. Yep. Any other questions? Donations? Tickets. tickets. Oh, tickets. You are the man. All right, I got tickets. Here's your, get your tickets here. All right, we got tickets. You got, you got this, right? You guys and gals got that one? I'll put that back on. All right, so, uno. You don't need them? All right. Dos. Trace. Thank you so much. Thanks You're for the welcome. Speech, man. Hey, no worries. All right. Thank, thank you. Here you go. And then remember, if you win, I get half. They get. Okay? Oh, man. They should have, like. There's a drawing at the um, social tonight or this afternoon. So, um, and you can always sell your ticket to somebody else. <laughs> These are not drink tickets. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you for coming. Thank you. No, that's right. No. Yep. There you go. There you go. You're welcome. Thank you. Oh. Oh. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yours got a little rip in it. You, I'm assuming because you streamed it, it's let, I can find it's this on YouTube. On YouTube, on my channel, yeah. Great presentation. Uh, we do the same thing over four hours. Oh, yeah. We kept everybody awake. So oh, I know. We try. We try. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Oh, cool. Thank you so much. Sure thing. Come back when you can't stay as long. <laughs> thank you. I watch you on the uh, YouTube. Oh, there you. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> it finally is. There you go, brother. Hey. Enjoyed it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. I don't know when the last, I mean, we've talked and been to various classes and things. I don't yeah. remember when the last one was. It was a while ago, probably. Good to see you again, too. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thanks. Uh, thank you, sir. Whoop, 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 whoop. I was, uh, uh, there you go. Thank you. Have a good day. Hey, sure, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice meeting you. Hey, you're next, right? Next. How's it going? All right. I am. Uh, I'm closing up shop. Thanks everybody for watching, and uh, we'll catch you this afternoon.